Welcome back friends, Zach here with Dr. Eyeball MD. Welcome to the channel and today I'm gonna show you how to take ocular vital signs and the five things you need to know before you call the ophthalmologist. Let's get into it. All right, before we get started, let me just fix this. Perfect, and let's fix one more thing. Perfect, all right, we are ready to go. So in today's video, we're gonna go over five things that you should know before you call your ophthalmologist that will not only help them to triage a patient's condition and kind of know you know, the severity of it and try to get an idea of what's going on, but it can also help you as a provider to maybe kind of triage and figure out what's going on. I'm gonna go into those things, I'm gonna explain them to you. This is gonna be helpful for if you are a medical student and you're doing an ophthalmology rotation or you're doing any kind of rotation and you're gonna consult the ophthalmologist or maybe you're going into ophthalmology as a new resident and you're wondering kind of the just basic things to do when you examine a patient, uh, maybe on call or something like that. Or if you're an ER physician or essentially any other physician in the hospital who's gonna call an ophthalmology consult, this video is gonna be helpful because these are five easy things that you can check um, that anybody can check. Any doctor should be able to do this. It doesn't need to be done by an ophthalmologist. And by checking these things, you help your ophthalmologist know what's going on with the patient. And a lot of times you can probably figure out what's going on too. So I'm gonna go into those five things. We're gonna keep this short and sweet because I want it to be very valuable to you guys. And it doesn't need to be long to do that because all this is pretty simple. Perfect, so number one is check the vision. So this is super easy to do. If you have a near card, that's gonna be one of the easiest ways to do it. It'll say at the bottom of the near card, either hold this at six feet from the patient or 14 inches. A lot of the patients are gonna be older. They're gonna be presbyopic, meaning they need reading glasses because they've lost their ability to read up close. That's the case. Give the patient their reading glasses, let them read it at 14 inches, um, and then check the vision in each eye separately. So you wanna have the patient cover one eye, check that eye, cover the other eye and check that one. We're more concerned about the individual vision in each eyes and less with the vision with both eyes. Make sure you check the eyes individually. If you don't have a near card, there are apps that you can get to pull up a near card on your phone. I'll put one on the video right here. This one is called the Eye Handbook. It's a free app and through it, you can do a lot of different ophthalmic testing. I use it on call, but for just kind of your general basic thing, go to the section where it says testing and then we're gonna open up the visual acuity card and you have it right there on your phone. So you have no reason to not have a way to check the patient's vision. If the patient's able, you can take them to a standard eye chart, a Snellen eye chart and have them stand at 20 feet and check it that way too but you can always just rely on using the app on your phone. So there's no reason to not know the vision before you call the ophthalmology consult. And if you're just evaluating a patient's eye health, it is basically the cornerstone of the ophthalmic vital sign is the vision. All right, perfect. So you got number one down, you've checked the vision. So number two is checking the pupils. So when we talk about checking a patient's pupils, it's best to turn the room to dark, as dark as you can, and then use either a pin light or any light. A lot of times there'll be a uh, ophthalmoscope or an otoscope even on the wall, like in the ER or something like that. Just get some light. I've used my iPhone flashlight before. The key here is to check each eye individually. So I'm gonna check the right eye, make sure the pupil constricts. I'm gonna check the left eye, make sure that it constricts. Are the pupils relatively the same size? Is one six millimeters and the other two millimeters, that could be a bad sign. So that's kind of what we're checking. If you want to take this a step further in something that we always check as ophthalmologists and that would be helpful if you're able to relay this to your ophthalmologist, um, it's not the easiest thing to pick up on if you're not used to it, but it's what's called a relative afferent pupillary defect. That's basically going to tell you is, is there some defect in the afferent or sensory part of the neural pathway of the eye to the brain. The way that you can do that is to do what's called the swinging flashlight test. And what you do basically is you just take your pin light, you shine it in one eye, and then you go to the other. You go back and forth and you do it at about this cadence. I would go shine here and back and back. And each time you go to the eye, um, it should constrict. If you go to this eye and the pupil does this, yes, there could be a problem in the sensory pathway of that eye, at least compared to the other eye. And that's suggestive of either damage to the optic nerve, or it could be from damage to the retina, very severe damage or something like that, or damage within the afferent system within the brain itself. But that's number two, check the pupils. At least make sure they look equal and that they constrict. And then if you wanna take it a step further, check for an afferent pupillary defect. All right, number three. So this one is gonna be pressure. And this is probably the hardest to check um, if you are not an ophthalmologist, but most ERs are gonna have what's called a Tonopin. It's simply just a small little 
little device that lets you check a patient's eye pressure. It does this is by just tapping it in the very center of the cornea. Uh, think of the cornea as the clear bubble over the colored part of the eye. So you're aiming right at the center of their pupil and you wanna go in perpendicular to the cornea. It's gonna have you tap, 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 tap on the cornea and it's gonna give you a numeric value. The range of this pressure for most people in the normal range is gonna be somewhere from about 11 millimeters of mercury to 21 millimeters of mercury. Um, if the pressure reading is super high, you know, it's in the 40s, 50s, that could be something like angle closure glaucoma or neovascular glaucoma, or it can pick up things that are very low as well. If you don't have a tona pin, which some of you are not going to have, a simple substitute is just to feel the eyes. So just have the patient close their eyes, use your thumbs, and kind of press on the eye. Now you're not going to be able to gauge an exact numeric value of the pressure by doing this, but what you can do is decide if the eye is super hard or does it feel maybe super, super soft. Now the key here is to compare. So if I have a patient with a very red, pain eye and then a normal eye on the other side and I feel the normal eye and then I compare it to the painful red eye and that red eye feels like a marble or super hard like a rock then it suggests that the pressure could be very high that's just kind of a poor man's way to get a gauge of the pressure perfect all right you've got the first three things down let's move on to number four number four is the extraocular movement so this is basically just testing the movement of the eyes in the cardinal directions of gaze and it not only tests the function of the extraocular muscles but the nerves that control those muscles specifically the cranial nerves three, four, and six. We can pick up a lot of really dangerous pathology just by testing the extraocular muscles. We can pick up things like intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. We can pick up things like cranial nerve three palsies. Um, so basically what you're gonna do before you call the ophthalmologist is have the patient look straight ahead, look at your finger, and then you're just gonna have them look side to side without moving their head as far as they can to the right, as far as they can to the left. And then we're gonna go up in kind of an H pattern, have them look up this way, down, come back, down, and up. And you wanna look at each eye. Make sure each eye is moving fully and kind of compare the two eyes. If the patient looks to the side, right eye looks to be looking very far out here, but when they look to the other side, the left eye really doesn't go quite as far as the right eye. It could suggest damage to one of the nerves that controls those eye movements. The way you can tell the ophthalmologist about that is say, I tested the extraocular movements. The left eye does not either abduct all the way or adduct all the way or it has limited elevation or depression. If you can do that, I think it'll be very helpful when you're calling an ophthalmology consult. All right, number five, and this is the last one. This is also super easy to check, and that's the confrontation of visual field. Now, in medical school, they teach you a lot of weird ways to do this, where you have your fingers wiggling and coming in like a bowl. You can do that, but I think the easiest way, and the way I like to do, is just to check uh, in four quadrants of each eye individually. So what I'll do is have the patient cover one eye and focus on my nose. I'll tell them to keep focus on my nose and that I'm testing their peripheral vision. And then what I'll do is hold up either a one, two, or a five in four different quadrants. So the infranasal, the infrotemporal, the suprotemporal, and the uh, supranasal. And that can basically tell me if the patient can't see the top part, or maybe they can't see the bottom part, it could suggest a hemifield defect. It could suggest like uh, non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy, or if perhaps they can't see one vertical field, so they can't see anything out here, but they see fine over here. And if that's the same in both eyes, it could suggest a homonymous hemianopsia, and that could suggest a stroke. As a first year, I diagnosed a patient as having a likely stroke when she couldn't see a pie in the sky in each eye. We sent her to the ER and she had had an acute stroke. So this can be an actually very important part of the ophthalmic exam. Also, if a patient has something like a retinal detachment, maybe they can't see in one particular sector in one eye if that retinal detachment is not complete, which most of the time it won't be. So you can pick up those visual field defects and it can be really helpful for the ophthalmologist to get an idea of what's going on and to kind of triage the severity of what's going on. It can also help you to further narrow your differential as to what's going on with the patient's eye. All right guys, so those are five super easy ways to just check the ocular vital signs and to know the basics about what's going on with the eye. Now you can tell your ophthalmologist these things and then when they come to do a more comprehensive exam, they're going to look under a microscope. They may dilate the patient's eye and really get an idea of exactly what's going on. But if you're in a pinch and you need to try to figure it out yourself, these are five super easy ways to just get a basic idea. And if you're going to call a console, if you can tell the ophthalmologist these five things, it will not only make your ophthalmologist very happy, but it will also help them to get an idea of what's going on with the patient. If you guys found this helpful, comment down below and let me know. And I can go into more detailed ophthalmic exams for you guys that are interested. Even if you're not in ophthalmology, we can talk about some of those things. If you guys enjoy these videos, learning about ophthalmology, learning about medicine, and learning about the life of an ophthalmology resident and that kind of thing, subscribe to the channel. I'm Zach with Dr. Eyeball MD, and I'll see you guys in the next one.